Okay, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, or welcome to those of you who've just joined us. My name is Paul Asquith. I work for the African Foundation for Development, who's been a, a partner of the Centre of African Studies and SOAS for a number of years. And it is with great pleasure and honour that uh, I'm chairing this panel, the topic of which is Actors and Perspectives in the Future of African Development. And we have a, a diverse range of speakers from very different backgrounds with very different research interests to inform the, the topic of discussion we have, which is, in a nutshell, if Africa has changed as much as it has over the last 100 years, how might it change over the next 100 years? with a particular focus on topics of development and governance. And I think it's significant because there is a, a long historical relationship between African studies and what we term development studies and notions of development. And as part of this relationship, Africa as a continent has figured largely as a canvas, as an idea, uh, a testing ground, a leitmotif indeed, for what uh, uh, should or could constitute development. Now, I think we all will have seen the pace of change in Africa over the last 20 years, certainly the last 20 plus years that I've been working in or on Africa, that transformation has been enormous. I think it's just as likely that that pace of transformation is likely to accelerate and the next 100 years are likely to be incredibly exciting for the African continent. But it throws up key questions for us about what that development will be and done in whose name. So, with no further ado, and following quite neatly, I think, on from this morning's discussion, which focused on issues of culture and identity, and we saw from the, the presentations this morning that these issues directly affect people's ability to engage in whatever development is, or whatever modernity is, or whatever globalization is. Um, I think it forms a, quite a natural segue into our first speaker, Kenneth Muzata, from the University of Zambia who will be speaking on policy and consistencies in language of instruction in Zambia. So, with no further ado, I'm going to hand the floor over to Kenneth, please. Good afternoon. Usually when you're coming from lunch, become lazy and so on. So I hope we'll be awake. Kenneth Mzata, my name's from the University of Zambia. Um, I'm not representing the university though, because the time I sat to look for an avenue to present the ideas about the language of instruction, I came across SOAS. And I clicked the button and thought I should send my abstract. And then it came. I was given a chance to come, thanks to the organizers. That definitely, at the end of the day, a voice for the minority perhaps can be heard. And it can start from here. And it's starting from SOAS at 100 years. Thank you very much. Policy inconsistencies in language of instruction, a vehicle for the extinction of minority languages in Zambia. Many are times when we conduct research and we are usually wooed by numbers because we are told 60%, 80% of the respondents say this and therefore this informs policy. What about the 40%? How do you take care of them? What about the 20%? How do you take care of them? Ladies and gentlemen, language policy, I believe, is an it's a very difficult phenomenon for most countries, especially those that have um, multilingual combinations, you know? But we all know very well that language is a very important tool, not only to education, but to development as well. Language identifies you as a, a national, it identifies you as a, an individual. It is a conduit for cultural values, norms, beliefs, definitely it gives you that confidence, that self-identity, definitely it identifies you as uh, uh, an individual. So it is very important that no matter how minor the language may be, yes, it is 
important to the national identity and to the individual identity. Now, if we forget the fact that minority languages can go extinct if we make poor policies, then definitely 100 years from now, you will not see any minority languages around. First of all, let me make, I would like to make it clear that what do you consider as minority? Because philosophically, when you look at the term minority itself, perhaps it doesn't even exist, or maybe it does. It is only minor in terms of numbers. But the truth of the matter is that where two people converse and understand each other, if language is used for, converse, for conversation, they should be able to understand each other, then I don't think that is minor. It's an important tool for communication. So definitely it, it must be taken care of. Education in a minority language is an important way to maintain the status and further the development of that minority language. Many languages have become endangered simply because the language is not transferred to the next gen generation. That was a quote from STEC 2017, as latest as 2017. What is happening in Zambia? Historically, we were colonized by the Britons. Okay. And first of all, we had missionaries. And the missionaries used local languages. They first went and I mean, learned local, local languages, taught us in local languages. And then from there, we came the BSA company. We also took over using local languages here and there. They were used in, in the classroom and so on. Then from there, the Phelps Talks comes in. They introduce the language of instruction as English. And so we took it from there. But there were challenges even then. The challenges were um, teaching in English itself. People feel, we have talked about the identity issues here. People feel that learning in a foreign language means that you are still colonized. Okay, fine. So what do we do? Changes in the policies continued. You, we, we find ourselves in a situation where we started to introduce selected local languages. Four of them were picked, Bemba, Lozi, Tonga, and Nyanja. But in a country of about 72 <coughs> local languages and dialects, okay? And so four only represent. But after seven, 1964, there was an introduction of other three languages that were, were, were picked from, from the northwestern part of Zambia. Now, this time around, I know time signals have started. This time around, 2013, we introduced a new policy in the language of instruction. We say we need to teach these learners from grade one to four in the familiar local language. What is the familiar local language from grade one to four? Familiar local language. What is the familiar local language? This is simply a language that is representing the other languages that every child who is growing perhaps by connotation understands. But the thing is, does every child know the so-called familiar language that has been introduced as a language of instruction? Me, as I speak now, I would say I am Lvali. But within Lvali, there are about four dialects which I don't even understand. But the teaching perhaps is going through, not perhaps, is going through <coughs> the media of, of instruction as Lvali. What about the minority? So I carried out a study on the experiences of teachers in using the local language of instruction that was introduced in 2013. That introduction of that particular policy is actually a recycle of the time before independence because that was tried. And then with a lot of challenges of materials, with the complaints of the minority languages that we consider dialects, with all those complaints put aside, we still bring in back this particular policy. So I tried to find out from the teachers their experience of teaching in these local languages that have been selected to represent the 72 minority languages. What do I find? Ladies and gentlemen, some teachers, Zambia is a highly multilingual country. Some teachers that have moved from one area to another have even lost their own languages. They cannot teach fluently in their own mother tongue. They would rather teach in English, or they would teach in the local language, in the area they have stayed longer. Now the question is, what about those 
whose language is not even used as a language of instruction and are considered minority. I ask about the performance of learners within the classroom, those that are from the minority languages. Teachers still tell us, yes, please. Teachers still tell us, <laughs> I thought it's two minutes from, from right, yes. So teachers still tell us that the performance of those learners is actually lower. That then means that there is a problem in the language of instruction. We need to come up with policies that are inclusive. If there is a section of society that makes certain people feel that they are not part and parcel of this particular society, then there is a problem there in policy. While we are doing away with, we want to do away with English, you speak of course from grade five onwards, but to introduce a local language at the base when children actually are supposed to be built properly at tender ages, it becomes a very, very big problem for the minority languages. Eventually, there will be extinction. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth, uh, both for keeping your presentation very sharply on time, which was impressive, but also uh, uh, for picking up on these very important themes, which other speakers touched on this morning, and I'm mindful of uh, Camille's paper in particular in relation to language policy in Algeria. We've seen similar uh, uh, issues in Rwanda, for example, or in Ethiopia, which is a country I know uh, better. So, uh, uh, thanks to Kenneth. Now, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Salvatore Mancuso from the University of Cape Town, who's uh, uh, very kindly been able to join us, despite a rather difficult journey, I think, from Cape Town, who's going to be speaking about the Somali legal system. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me and accepting my, um, my presentation. Um, I uh, have also to um, make a special vote of thank uh, to the person who assisted me with my flight arrangement with her, for her patience and commitment to uh, welcome my special needs. Uh, I will try to make uh, my presentation also sharp in seven minutes and uh, not to be too, too technical because uh, I know that uh, being a lawyer I will be uh, boring for uh, most of you if not for all of you but you know someone has to do the dirty job and so uh, uh, lawyers uh, are always around you know. Uh, I will try, why Somalia? Uh, I think, uh, um, I mean, my idea in presenting this paper um, is that what is happening today in Somalia uh, for the possible development of, a, of the legal system is something that could be uh, a sort of uh, uh, mirror for what is going on in many African countries in terms of uh, developing their legal system. I said I'm speaking about mixed jurisdiction, but I won't speak about mixed jurisdiction technically, because technically when we talk about mixed jurisdiction, we talk about common law and civil law countries uh, where the two legal traditions are, are uh, uh, melted. Uh, for example, South Africa, the country where I'm coming from is uh, traditionally considered one of the uh, one mixed jurisdiction as well as Scotland or Quebec or Louisiana and other like this. Somalia uh, has a very strange situation because uh, as you know Somalia comes from the uh, unification of two of the former Italian and British Somali territories and when this unification was made in the, in 1960 uh, the, uh, there was already an element of technical mixity because the system was largely based on the Italian legal system and therefore on the civil law model. But uh, on the other side, 
there was uh, the, the, the criminal procedure was based on the uh, Indian Criminal Procedure Act of 1872 or something like that that was applicable in Somaliland at the time of unification. So there was an element of mix, mixity already. But what is more interesting is the fact that um, the, uh, the system that today we have in force in Somalia is actually the one in force at the time of the fall of Siad Barre in, 1990, in January 1991. Because as you know, afterwards Somalia became a, a failed state, the, the emblem of the failed state. And this meant the fact that we didn't have a government or uh, a legislative body able to change the law. And also uh, courts or another system uh, of judicial administration for administering this, these courts. So we have, in this period of failed state, we have a further element of great mixity because the 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 the, the tradition the, the the Somali tradition legal tradition that was uh, put down during the Siad Barre regime obviously went up uh, in in this period the Islamic law also raised up in terms of application but you have to imagine that also for those areas where religious or traditional law was difficultly ap applicable we have element of mixity. Just to give you an example, there was no authority to incorporate companies in Somalia in this period. So the Somali citizens went to Dubai, incorporating companies there, and they were bringing, and then they were making these companies made under du uh, the Emirates law, working in Somalia and adapting the, the, the legal uh, the legal rules, I, I would say, or the legal way of functioning of those companies to the Somali society. Today we have, and I mean, let me give you quickly an, an element that I think is, is important, is the fact that uh, this is a sort of atypical legal pluralism. I mean, for those who are familiar with the, the, the issue of legal pluralism, when we think about legal pluralism, we think about competing legal orders uh, that uh, are present in, in the legal system of one given country. But we take for granted the fact that one of the competing legal order is the law of the state. Somalia gives the example that the law of the state can be absent, and there is also a form of legal pluralism given by those elements that I was mentioning before. Today we have a, a federal co uh, constitution. Uh, Somalia is uh, embarking into a federal experience with a lot of difficulties. I mean, I'm taking a, a, a aside the, 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 the situation in terms of, uh, um, of dis uh, disorders, internal disorders, but from in terms of purely legal, legal situation, the Somali government is still figuring out how to put in practice the federal, the federal option. We have the problem of Somaliland that is going on with its own legal development, even if it's not recognized as an independent state. And uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have a country that is, uh, that is trying to understand in which direction uh, it has to re rebuild the legal system. The law in force is uh, strongly influenced by the, by the civil, uh, civil law mo uh, pattern. We have common law elements. We have religious elements. We have uh, traditional elements all present in the reality. We have a lot of consultants coming from different legal backgrounds that are in Mogadishu presently working with NGOs, uh, international organizations, um, and other entities trying to propose ways to, uh, to um, improve the legal system or to reform the legal system in Somalia. And obviously each one brings uh, or puts forward the, the model or the pattern he knows better, the one from the country comes from. So this creates, creates tension. The final point is what? First, from the, from the 
purely legal point of view, the Somali government obviously has to make a great choice having, having uh, adopted the federal option, dividing the legislative competencies between the, the federal states and the central states, first of all. But secondly, uh, the, the history of Africa tells us that we cannot take aside the, the, the local legal cultures and therefore the legal culture must be incorporated uh, into the legal system. And when I'm talking about legal culture, I'm talking about what is normally called, uh, this morning we, we were, uh, the panel was about identity, I don't like the word customary law, so let's use the word traditional or informal law, but we have also to, to accommodate uh, religious law. The final point is that we are in the situation of potential great mixity with a, a, a huge situation of legal pluralism. The, big, the, the real point is how to make these legal orders not competing anymore, but cooperating. And so completing each other in a way that we can accommodate the different, uh, the different traditions without creating a situation of clash. Finished. Thank you. Thank you, Salvatore, for, again, for keeping your presentation perfectly on time. I think you raised some important points, uh, particularly about uh, the mixed legal systems prevalent in a range of different African states and the extent to which these do or do not underpin uh, governance and therefore politics and development. And I'm slightly mindful, I'm sure there's a Kipling quote about uh, uh, making mock of men in uniforms who watch us while we sleep. So having a robust legal system, having a robust uh, uh, governance is fundamental to how we construct development. So, with no further ado, let me introduce our next speaker, who is Mary Dunbau from the University of Basel, who will be speaking about uh, family planning in Africa. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Mari, uh, as Paul mentioned, and I'm a PhD candidate in epidemiology at the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute, which is an associated institute of the University of Basel. Uh, for three years, I conducted field work using a health social sciences approach in the province of South Kivu, Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, or the DRC. And much of my work took place on this island to your right, Ijwi Island, on Lake Kivu, which is bordering the country of Rwanda. My research explores fertility patterns and contraceptive use in the region. Uh, today I'd like to discuss recent trends in health and development programs with the professed aim of bringing sexual and reproductive rights to populations in Sub-Saharan Africa. They're mainly encouraging women and more and more in the recent years men to delay childbearing, to have smaller families, and to space children out over longer periods of time ideally using these so-called modern methods of contraception, such as pills, injections, or implants. Reproductive norms in the DRC tend overall to be um, extremely high, uh, these, uh, beginning in the teenage years, and the most recent demographic and health survey showed that the average number of children per woman in this province was 7.7. .7. Modern contraception was just recently introduced on a wide scale, and uptake as of now is very low. In thinking along the central theme of this conference, when we're imagining the future in terms of development, especially in the context of health in Sub-Saharan Africa, I'd argue that the past is the first place that we have to start. Because reproduction is a site of power negotiation, development programs addressing sexual and reproductive health are inherently political. And they're also inherently part of a very recent history of colonial manipulation, control, and uh, coercion of bodies. Perhaps nowhere was reproduction manipulated as flagrantly as a socio-political and economic force than in colonial Belgian Congo. The atrocities and exploitation committed during King Leopold's regime led to extraordinarily high rates of adult and infant mortality, 
In some areas of the colony, infant mortality was as high as 90%. The Congolese population was decimated by the first decade of the 20th century. As capitalist enterprises in the colony lacked able-bodied workers, quote, industrial labor anxieties emerged on the continent in Europe. To fill this labor void, pro-natalist policies for the colony were framed on the continent as patriotic endeavors communicated through overtly racist discourse and professing unapologetic economic aims. This patriotic plea from a leader in the colonial pro-natalist movement in 1926 illustrates perfectly. Without black labor, she says, our colony would never be able to send to Europe the wealth buried in its soil. To protect the child in the Congo is a duty not only of altruism, but of patriotism. Nancy Rose Hunt, an American historian, writes of various pronatalist policies and interventions in the, Congo, in the colony, including forced prenatal care, cash bonuses for births, the active discouragement of traditional abstinence and breastfeeding practices to space births, and in mass monitored feeding of children older than one year by colonial agents. Contemporary contraceptive programs then are implemented against this backdrop of colonial reproductive coercion and violation as well as mid-century population control movements rooted in eugenics and elitist, quote, race and class anxieties over the quality of population growth. And certainly in the discourse surrounding so much of recent immigration crises in both Europe and the United States, we still see these similar population anxieties and panics manifested. Over the course of three years in South Kivu, I conducted an evaluation of a family planning program implemented on Ijwi Island by an international NGO. This program aimed to encourage modern contraceptive use and the practice of birth spacing, which is a World Health Organization recommendation to place at least two years between a woman's last birth and her next attempt at conception. As part of this NGO's program, women were eligible to receive cash payments from 15 to 24 months after their last birth, as long as they did not deliver a subsequent child. Women could have received up to 38 US dollars for following the program, which was a substantial amount of money on an island where 83% of individuals in 2012 were living on less than $1 a day. Conditional cash transfers, or CCTs, such as this, are a development strategy that were first adopted in Latin America in the 1990s, whereby payments to individuals are conditional on the adoption of a particular practice or a service attendance. As CCTs have emerged in African settings and spread rapidly around the world, they generally target specific health behaviors over a shorter period of time, rather than broad poverty alleviation strategies as was the case in earlier Latin American programs. CCTs have gained widespread support from influential institutions such as the World Bank, and evidence shows that they do have an effect on reaching particular development outcomes. Conditional cash transfers then seem to be the future of health and development in Africa. CCTs operate though on a market-based rationality. So in low contraceptive uptake settings such as South Kivu, all that is needed to push women to use family planning, it's assumed, is to bring reproductive decisions into the market. If we assign non-reproduction a monetary value, so the reward becomes immediate, tangible, profitable, and therefore rational. However, high fertility in South Kivu province is a woman's path to social personhood. Fertility secures her a place in her husband's home, her husband's fidelity, access to her husband's kinship network resources, and social recognition and clout in her community. Market logic, therefore, ignores the fact that reproductive decisions are embedded in complex sociocultural norms, negotiations, and very personal emo emotional desires contingent on a multitude of factors and actors. So one of my central questions to my colleagues on this panel and to you, the audience, is do we really want market and incentive-based development programs for poor people, especially those targeting sexual and reproductive health choices, to be the driving force of a new generation of development strategies? Accounts from the colonial era are evidence to how sexual and reproductive health policy and practices historically reflect the socioeconomic and political priorities, not of the program beneficiaries, but rather of the powers driving the programs into existence. However, if these programs help or even push some women to practice family planning and ultimately make healthier reproductive health choices, are the ideologies and modalities to reach that end justified? Ultimately, I believe we must ask why it is acceptable to set stringent behavioral limitations on the poor, 
namely who should and should not have children, when and how many, while those at the top of the capital game, those using the most resources per capita, and those largely subscribing to a free market ideology that champions individual choice, free will, and self-determination are free to realize their own reproductive preferences without incentives, limitations, or coercion. By incentivizing a particular reproductive agenda, especially in poor populations, conditional cash transfers go explicitly against the sexual and reproductive rights-based frameworks that most health and development institutions claim to champion. So considering that cash, cash transfers do, in fact, seem to have an effect on health behavior, but that they occupy this ambiguous ethical space, what is the alternative proposition? Anthropologist James Ferguson introduces the idea of a new politics of distribution, where individuals, especially the poor, including those not engaged in wage labor, may be entitled to, quote, cash payments as rightful shares that are due to owners, rooted in a conviction that citizens, and particularly poor and black citizens, are the rightful owners of a vast and national wealth of which they have been unjustly deprived through an historic process of racialized dispossession. Ferguson and other scholars urge us to imagine possibilities beyond normative market-based thinking, that cash must necessarily be exchanged for something, such as labor, or in the case of CCTs as a reward for what is deemed as best practice by dominant power structures. Rather, can we imagine a health and development paradigm where, quote, it is better to give money to poor people directly so that they have, can find effective ways to escape from poverty themselves? and in the context of my discussion today, realize their reproductive rights. I would argue for a return to the wealth and opportunity redistribution routes that drove some of the first cash trans transfer programs in the 1990s, but reimagined to fit the contextual needs, priorities, and rights of local populations in Sub-Saharan Africa. Also, further research to understand how making cash transfers unconditional could shift the underlying paternalistic and often coercive dynamics of CCTs while achieving small, similar, if not better, and further reaching outcomes across development fields and beneficiaries. It is worth noting that a paradigmatic shift that places reproductive rights at the center of dialogue may not always result in outcomes as defined by dominant discourse in the global north. Although my research would suggest differently, women on Ijwi Island may continue to choose to have 13 children, even after they are given the tools to facilitate a different choice. Ultimately, whatever reproductive choice women and men make, their choice once made freely and without coercion is their right. A truly rights-based framework that prioritizes and facilitates autonomy through resource redistribution as well as informed decisions could be foundational in the widespread realization of reproductive health, development, well-being, and fundamental rights for women and men in Africa in the near future. Thank you. Thanks again to Marie for uh, delivering her presentation. Bang on time, even though I slightly messed up my card timing. So uh, thanks, a very interesting presentation as well around a topic that's of great uh, uh, controversy and also highly politicized in the current context. Uh, as someone who has previously worked in public and sexual and reproductive health, I very, recognize very much uh, the point she raised, but also in uh, the field that uh, myself and my colleague Onyikachi work in, which is around migration and development policy, practice and research, uh, this issue, I'd even suggest there's even a moral panic about uh, questions of overpopulation in the global south, and particularly in Africa. So I think uh, Murray's presentation sort of very helpfully framed that. So with no further ado, let me hand you over to our next speaker, Detlef, from the University of Bonn and I will try and set up his PowerPoint as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Uh, um, good afternoon. I will try to contribute some theoretical uh, thoughts to uh, our panel in response to the organizers' questions of how to relate development and future and future making. And to begin with, I would like to um, just point to the formulation of the topic of this conference. Um, I would rather prefer to talk about Africa's futures in plural and not in singular. And I think this is not a trivial um, um, differentiation because if we talk about uh, the future in singular, it implies that there is only one future. 
And this will be completely wrong when we look at the African continent, not only at Africa, but at the world at large. So what we need to understand is how a future of possibilities can unfold in a world where development rather goes into one particular direction. That brings me to the topic of what I want to elaborate about without really having a program. I, I see when Paul stops me how far I can get with the uh, seven points in seven minutes plus a map. I begin with a map um, because the map um, that's, is the only representation of my own discipline. I'm a geographer, as you can see from the production of the map. And that brings us to, to the idea I want to talk about. Um, much of what is happening in terms of development in Africa is a development that is conceived not by Africans, but by others. And we have to see how um, visions of Africa's futures and the visions of the people themselves in Africa coincide or rather clash with the visions of the development makers. And that has a lot to do with space making. What you do see in the map is um, a network of development corridors or growth corridors as they're also uh, called that are crisscrossing the African continent. Some of them already operational, some of them still in the planning stage or, or under construction. And the outline of such a system of development corridors does have major impacts on the transformation of the countryside and the regional economic structure. And this is, this is somehow built into the method of uh, implementing development corridors. I will no longer elaborate uh, about that because it's part of a major, um, develop, uh, a major research project we are just launching at the universities of Bonn and Cologne under the title Future Rural Africa. So um, in 12 years we can talk about the results of that um, <laughs> project. Um, I have seven uh, points. The first one, very briefly, uh, what is the future? Um, I'm referring to a book um, uh, published by John Ari a year ago with the same title, What is the Future? And the question is not a trivial uh, question because uh, one very important point um, John Ari and others also do have is that um, envisioning the future has a lot to do uh, with um, your cultural or social uh, background. So there are different ways of uh, looking at the future which have something to do with the time frames um, in which people live. And whenever we look at a situation of development, um, it is a clash of different time frames. So people who are living in an area um, uh, have a vision of the future that does also include their children and grandchildren. Uh, for development officials, usually they think in terms of um, uh, project cycles and other um, time frames, which may be quite different from uh, the time frames of local population. Um, second point, um, how is the future produced, um, future is made. As researchers, we can't really approach the future as such, but what we can research is the way how the future is folded into the present. And one way of doing that is um, to look at practices of future making. Future making, I would define as the translation of vision into practice. So the visions are important, and the big question is where do these visions come from? Who has produced the visions, and which interests are embedded in the, in the formulation? of uh, visions. Development, I would argue, quite often has the tendency uh, to uh, securitize um, processes, so to pretend that there is something like certainty about the future. But again, this would be a complete misconception of the future. The future is by definition unknown and open. And if you do plan for the future, and that's what uh, you have to do when you plan a development project, you have to make assumptions about future conditions which may be completely out of the place. And um, I think this is something we have to be aware of how uh, the very concept of development is arguing with certainty, whereas on the other hand, visions of the future always have something to do of how to get along with uncertainty. I think this is a major problem that we need to understand. How can we research practices of future making? Well, I would follow a suggestion by um, Arjun Padurai in his essay on the future as culture fact, where he distinguishes three practices uh, of future making, um, anticipation, imagination, and aspiration. What's interesting about these three uh, practices of future making is that anticipation is closely related to our, if you like, Western scientific way of looking at the future, making it calculable, putting it into statistics, 
uh, and into plans and into development. Whereas a future of aspiration is something completely different. That's the future of dreams that may be unrealistic, but that is the expression of what people want. And that has a lot to do with hope and spaces of hope. And that's an argument I'm borrowing from David Harvey, um, a Marxist geographer who writes about utopian thinking and what he calls spaces of hope. So if we try to better understand how futures are, are produced and what potentials possible futures have, we need to understand um, what um, uh, Apadurai talks, the capacity to aspire. So how can people in Africa, uh, what, what ideas do they, do they have and what capacities do they have to express their own ideas and translate them into development planning? I think this is a fundamental question that we need to take into account in development studies. Um, where does that lead when we try to connect um, future making with space? One um, concept I find interesting here comes from Sheila Jasonov and uh, Science and Technology Studies where she talks about dreamscapes of modernity. These dreamscapes of modernity often may be completely unrealistic. Um, and what she is observing in her historical examples about uh, dream, dreamscapes of modernity is that quite often these are um, models that are copied um, from one part of the world and then transferred to other um, parts of the world. And this is quite often what's happening in development planning, and here I come to the development corridors, who I would say uh, basically are blueprints for modernization, which were not born in Africa, but somewhere in the world. And that's my last point. If we look at the planners themselves, the people who are planning um, development corridors in Africa, or who are behind the formulation of national plans, like Kenya's Vision 2030, Tanzania's Vision 2025, and you name all these visions and renaissance and whatever, um, these guys come from, well, London, Germany, um, Singapore, uh, and the models they have in mind are um, models of Singapore as a role model for the future development of Kigali, for example. Um, uh, Singapore also um, as, a, as an example of the uh, planning of the Walfish Bay Corridor in Namibia. So these are real dreamscapes of modernity that are harmful to um, African development. And that's my last question. I, d I do not have an answer to that, but I hope we will discuss it further in the panel. How can we actually reconcile um, visions that are um, technocratic visions that may perhaps be feasible because they prove to work in other parts of the world? And how, we ca how can we Africanize these visions so that they are not um, blueprints that are just transferred without being sufficiently embedded in African culture, needs, and society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Detlef, for a, a fascinating vision. And I think vision is the word here because we're talking about future visions of Africa. And I was minded uh, during your presentation, there's an uh, advert for I think it's orange mobile phones here, where the slogan is, the future is bright. And I think when we talk about development, we assume that the future will be bright, even though the historical evidence would suggest to the contrary. So um, on that note, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Onyekachi Wambu, who will be speaking about uh, uh, migration and mobility in 21st century Africa. Good afternoon. I'm not going to answer the questions that are coming up. Um, they were suggested to us, uh, as the last speaker said, as a way of kind of framing all of our conversations. I will respond to some of them, um, but I think they're there and um, may be useful later on for our conversation, our broader conversation. But I wanted to talk really about um, demographics and in amongst that how demographics impact migration and I also wanted to if there was a third team uh, theme that I wanted to address it was um, automation uh, and what does all this mean for Africa 100 years hence 
Um, a few weeks ago, I was at a conference. Um, as we all are in the UK, we're obsessed by Brexit and what's going to happen after 2019. And this particular conference was um, looking at how the, the UK might re-engage with Africa and um, looking at investment models um, and win-win kind of uh, trade and investment between the UK and Africa. And what was interesting was that the conversation was around the usual finance, it was around um, intellectual services, um, other commodities. Basically, it was the usual thing that we would do in a, uh, have in a trade conversation, but there was nothing about labor, there was nothing about people. It was all about money. And, um, and we were talking about what it was that each side traded and what we could do. So it was the usual conversations about oil, about you know the things, the resources that Africa have, and then what is it that Africa needed from, from the West, and, um, and from the UK in particular. And, and my contribution to the conversation was this, to say that actually what Africa is, one of the big things that Africa has to trade are, is labor. And if we're serious, we need to be putting that on, on the agenda. Uh, at the moment, Africa is exporting this labor in a very dysfunctional manner. We see that um, um, with the people crossing the Mediterranean in, in various states of distress and the deaths. But um, there could be a model for how we um, skill up that labor and export it in a much more meaningful way. And this is really important if we look 100 years hence, because as I said, Africa is exporting labor because there's a, a huge demographic bulge on the continent at the moment. And that demographic bulge is leading to push factors in terms of migration. The biggest push factors is from the rural to the urban areas. A place like Lagos is going to expand Cairo. The big mega cities are going to expand in population because they're absorbing people from the rural areas. And then the second biggest push is across the African continent itself in terms of regions. Uh, and possibly the, the least of the pressures is the one that's going north to south, and which strangely enough is the one that's attracting the most conversation, uh, and we know why. So what's, what's this demographic explosion that we're talking about? The, according to the UN in, um, in 21, um, at the end of this century, um, 22, wherever we are, Africa will have 11 billion people. Sorry, the world will have 11 billion people. The world. But what is shocking is that Africa will constitute half of those 11 billion people. So we're looking at probably 5 billion on the African continent. Um, Nigeria alone will have 700 million. This, these are the projected figures. Um, what does that mean in a place like Lagos? <laughs> are we looking at a utopia? Or are we looking at a dystopia? Uh, what are we doing to talk about this in terms of um, what's going to happen to this labor? And it is ob obvious that Africa, if given those numbers and given that share of the world population, is going to carry on exporting labor. So how are we going to do this? And I'm really asking a series of questions. Uh, at a forward, in terms of the question, what do we mean by development? We, we think development's about a job. Um, because if, if you have a job, generally, the things that everybody else is trying to do for you in terms of building a well and all that, you can do for yourself. Where are these jobs going to come from um, at a time when we know uh, in the next hundred years that um, automation is going to destroy uh, a huge number of the jobs that we currently have. So these are some very kind of big issues that, that I, I would like a conversation about. I don't think I, you know, I'm not saying we have the answers yet. Um, but in terms of Africa's engagement with the world, if we the African population constitutes half the world's population, that engagement is going to be very different. 
Um, and what is that going to mean in terms of some of the questions that we've been talking about in terms of transnationalism, in terms of diaspora, in terms of culture, in terms of, you know, uh, and I'm talking now not just about African culture, but global culture. So these are going to be very huge questions um, that we look at. It could also be that Africa is expanding and producing lots of, um, lots of labor at a point, as I say, with automation that labor is not going to be needed because robots will do all, all the work. And so again, Africa will be caught out when you know, the world has shifted and how it does things and understands itself and we're producing again things that the world doesn't need. Um, the final point that I, I wanted to put out there was, was really that, um, you know, we've talked a lot about Africa and we're talking about the future, but there's been, and we do talk about the past because we're stuck in it, but I, on this question of labor, I think it's really important just to revisit the fact, fact that for certainly the last three, 400 years, Africa has been, again, exported a lot of labor, again, in a very dysfunctional and criminal way. As, as we know, as a result of the slave trade. So on that occasion, you know, people were kidnapped and enslaved and taken off to work uh, in plantations as part of this global system that, again, we, we, we seem to not want to talk about in its organic sense and the role of labor in that and who pays for that labor and where does that labor go and how is that labor going able to move around and be uh, and be free, free in all the senses um, that we understand that word, particularly when we talk about the period of enslavement. Um, it's important to note that most rich people can move around the world. If you've got two million, there's no country in the world that won't accept you. If you've got skills, there's no country in the world that won't accept you. So we're talking about, again, a particular group of people who can't move. And interestingly, the African continent, the movement within African countries and across the continent itself is restricted, is problematic, but it's freer than sometimes the, the broader movement north. So we, you know, we need to kind of interrogate um, what all of that means. Um, so I think um, for me, the question is in, in, in a hundred years time, five billion people, half the share of the world's population what are the opportunities for that and what are the challenges for that? Is it utopia or is it dystopia? Thank you. Thank you, Wanyakachi, for uh, uh, an interesting and inspiring discussion, perhaps slightly controversial. I hope it was slightly controversial for some people. But in, uh, in some ways, it may anticipate our, our last, but very much not our least uh, uh, speaker, which is Professor Chris Kramer. So if I could ask him to come onto the stage now, please. Hi, hello. Um, Salvatore was... Um, Slightly worried that other people think that lawyers are boring. Try being an economist. <laughs> um, so, be that as may. I, and, and my head is slightly buzzing with these very interesting kind of dreamscapes and visions and all sorts of ideas that have been running. But I want to try and talk about a very small part of at least what might be the present and, and, and the near future. Um, and because of, I think my argument is that whatever the very, very many things we think development involves or means to different people, arguably at its heart, there continues to be um, a process that, that's been identified long ago. And that's a process of a shift of people out of very low productivity economic activities and increasingly into higher productivity activities. Traditionally, that was thought to mean people moving from the countryside off their farms and into cities and into large urban factories. And the problems with that now are that people fear that cities cannot cope 
with the scale of the, 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 the possible influx. More than that, there are very great fears at the moment that industrialization, traditional industrialization, isn't what it used to be, that it doesn't generate jobs the, uh, for all that labor that Onyekachi was talking about at the same rate that it used to and has done in other parts of the world. So just when uh, mainstream development economists have rediscovered something called industrial policy and it's become quite fashionable, actually, possibly it no longer will kind of work the same magic, um, rather contorted magic that it, that it used to mean. Um, so people talk, for example, about the fears of premature deindustrialization in Africa. Um, and I think it's within that context that I, that I, I want briefly to, to mention this thing I call the industrialization of freshness, because there, is, there are different sources of employment and of foreign exchange earnings and things that are useful in the processes of development that are hugely significant globally and to Africa's future. There's a change, if you like, in which the factory is moving to the farm. Um, and I wanted to just sort of talk through a couple of examples and ask you which you think is the industrial product here. And you're supposed to say it's this, it's the carton of orange juice, and we don't have to, time to play games. It's not, it's the orange, okay? The orange is a much more high-tech sophisticated industrial product uh, than this. Why? Because any, any, anyone can put together a kind of uh, cardboard carton these, these days. And what they fill it with, typically, this is in South Africa, is the really bad quality oranges. Uh, so if you want to sell the really good stuff that gets high value, high prices, that's a, a harder thing to do. Right? That's the orange on the right. Um, if you, if, if this is just for an advert for machinery that does part of the kind of processing and cutting for macadamia nuts, uh, often in this country we, we get them just, just kind of uh, ready processed. But in some parts of the world, particularly in East Asia, people like to sit around and kind of prize them open. And there's a, a neat little incision that you, you make here. There's many, many stages in, in processing uh, macadamia nuts on the farm and, and elsewhere. Um, there's also a, a macadamia nut mafia in East Coast China, but that's, a, that's another story. Um, there's, the, there's, if you go around, this is, a, a, this is an interesting farm. This is a Dutch farm uh, in Ethiopia um, where the, the owner, and they, they grow poinsettia cuttings of seeds and so on, and, and, and they get then further processed in, in the Netherlands. And the owner was very much agreeing with me that what's going on in here is that he's, he's torturing they're, they're manipulating heat, uh, humidity, light, and so on and so forth. And they, they, they deprive, I didn't know this about plants, but apparently plants like to sleep. And what he does is he deprives them of sleep. A bit like Donald Rumsfeld depriving people of sleep and so on, so, so, somewhere else. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is a kind of amazing thing. And actually, the very interesting kind of green technology underpinning quite a lot of this as well. You know, you buy those avocados, is my last example. When you buy avocados and they have that sticker on and it says ripe and ready to eat. And five years ago, they weren't. You know, you'd crack this thing open and it would be kind of like a rock inside. It wasn't. Now, a higher proportion of them are. And it's very interesting to think what's gone into that. Um, and just one part. We could follow the chain from the genetic plant stock uh, R&D in California or whatever through to the very, very complex processes involved in meeting international phytosanitary standards, the IT systems that you need in order to barcode and be able to trace every carton of avocados, oranges, whatever it might be, uh, the very, very precise energy efficient application of inputs, so on. And then when you've got your avocado somewhere else, it gets cooled down to slow down the ripening process, and then it might arrive in, in, in southern England. And then it goes into a ripening facility where it's treated with ripening gases that affect the rate of ripening and so on. So yeah, this is, this is extraordinary stuff and, and, and increasingly sophisticated. And what I want to very briefly and simply say is all of this confirms 
how economists historically have thought of the industrial. And there are many different definitions of what that means, the industrial. But usually it involves kind of complex processes, you know, broken down into producing something. What Alan Young talked about in 1928, which is the insertion of an increasingly intricate nexus between the uh, raw commodity and the final consumer. You can, in other words, you can take these things and you can see, for those of you who may have done a little bit of your reading of Adam Smith, you all know about Adam Smith's pin factory, where he describes the, the breaking down of making a pin through a very efficient division of labor process into about 18 operations. And you can see that division of labor um, in the, the roundabout production of a bag of herbs in a, um, an Ethiopian herb factory. Um, actually, that one is supplying Tesco's here, I think, amongst, as well as the domestic market. Roundabout is another thing Alan Young talks about. That's what the industrial is. It's a, pr it's a roundabout process of production. And then I've got this round table here at the various times. <laughs> um, and there are many, many more pictures showing how many different steps there are involved in, in producing that. OK. Why does this matter? So one reason it matters is, as I've said, in a world in which traditional industrialization, the garments, the cars, and so on and so forth, might not be managing to solve the labor problem, right? uh, because of automation and things, only Katsu was talking about. This agro-industrialization may have a much higher rate of labor absorption. Right? So it might be one important part of the puzzle uh, of, of, of dealing with a very, very intense challenge. Second thing is that many policymakers, and I'm most familiar in some of this work with those in Ethiopia and in South Africa, who are concerned perhaps with dreamscapes of modernization. They're not from Singapore, they're from Ethiopia, they're from South Africa. But they have in mind a process of modernization in which they think that agriculture and the countryside is a slightly embarrassing leftover from the past. Uh, more uh, bright factories making cars and superconductors and things are more exciting. They're ignoring something with huge value gains, huge scope for employment, for an exchange, for technological change, so on and so forth. That's why I think it matters. It matters too because, I mean, this, for this audience less interesting, but, but many development economists are, have always been very pessimistic about the, the scope for gains from so-called primary commodities and processing them, and I think they're, they're missing a trick there. But, and this is a final thing I want to say, is if you want to succeed in what's effectively an extremely hostile world, but a high value world of production and trade in these things, you cannot just leave it to the market. Right? Uh, anywhere that succeeds in these, whether it's Peru or it's Brazil or it's South Korea and grapes or whatever it might be, anywhere that achieves success in this field of the industrialization of freshness, or by the way in the USA or the UK, does so on the basis of and with the support of very, very carefully designed, serious state interventions and support. And uh, that's where some of my work is, is looking at in the, in the policy gaps. But we don't have time to go into that, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, for a, a stimulating uh, discussion as well. Um, I'm almost tempted to abuse my chair's privilege here and ask Chris a question directly on the basis of his presentation. Uh, uh, are you optimistic about the future of in the potential for industrialization in Africa? I suppose we'll answer that. Oh, oh go on. From, from here? Do we, do we, do we, do we, do we? Um, I'm, I'm always optimistic. Yeah, you have to be. Um, otherwise, otherwise I'd, I'd give up and go home. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I think 
to go, it's a slightly more nuanced answer is that they're, um, all the kind of rhetoric of, of, of the African Renaissance and the rapid growth in, in recent years was actually very, very troubling because it didn't, in many places, really reflect a process of structural change. It was kind of unprocessed commodity boom stuff. Um, and I think it's partly because of that that people, mainstream development economists, sort of finally did come round to the need to push for structural change, including industrialization. But they don't fully know, and they disagree with one another on what that really involves. And um, I think what's this gives me a, an excuse to talk about Ethiopia. What I think is really, really interesting is the way in which uh, the few places where something genuinely, possibly very interesting is happening is in spite of the uh, development mainstream, not, not, not because of it. It's because of policy makers doing something. And it's fraught with contradictions, and it's very, very problematic. But there are things happening in Ethiopia which are almost, I think, unlike almost anywhere else, actually. Uh, and if it fails there, then I start to become a bit more pessimistic. Thank you. Um, I could happily speak about Ethiopia all day. Likewise. I was going to mention a quick anecdote. Earlier this week, I was speaking to an Ethiopian civil servant who was complaining vociferously about what he described as the North's development agenda that focused almost exclusively uh, on urban centers, on urbanization, uh, to the detriment of the larger rural populations. And he felt that this was a problem in northern development policy. Um, reading between your lines, I get the sense that it's not just a problem of northern development policy. It's a problem of development policy, full stop. But um, I don't want to get lost into an Ethiopian loving. I want to throw uh, questions and answers out to the floor. So has anyone got any questions for our panel? There's a lady at the back here on the left-hand side. <coughs> any more for it? And I'll take questions in groups of two or three. And uh, uh, there's another lady here on the left-hand side. She's right behind you there. Yeah. Um, hi, panel. I, I rather enjoyed quite a few presentations, but I'd like you to address um, the question of whether what you've been discussing isn't more or less the recolonization of Africa rather than the development of Africa. Could I slightly paraphrase that for you, madam? Uh, just slightly, and just suggest, is it about recolonization or just continued colonization? <laughs> OK. I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I really don't. And I think there was a lady here who had a question. Sorry, uh, here. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, I really enjoyed all the presentations. Um, thank you very much. I think maybe my question might go for, um, to the man from Afford. Um, and it's to mainly dealing with migration of the diaspora. Um, so what happens is usually, it, it sounds like a great thing. I mean, face forward uh, or face value, the, the diaspora going back home is a beautiful thing, but then usually what tends to happen is the culture breakdown or perhaps just the lack of understanding between maybe uh, a British Nigerian or a British Ghanaian going back to Ghana or Nigeria itself. Um, and in the country itself as well, perhaps the problem of people not really accepting diasporans just because perhaps of the sort of, yeah, you're a bit uppity. Uh, we don't want you to come and think that you know best, but come and adapt. But at the same time, the good intentions that perhaps the diaspora may have to come back and want to do well. So that sort of cultural clash and those clashes. Um, so essentially sort of looking behind the curtains of the pretty presentation of the diaspora going back. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, let's start with uh, 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 a panelist immediately on my left. I don't know if you've got any comments you want to make to these two points, Kenneth. Uh, just a comment perhaps on the, the first point and the first question, whether colonization or decolonization. Um, from the perspective of education and policy, the issues in Zambia, we find ourselves in a quagmire of some kind. Because, for example, if we move away from English at the moment, we are creating another problem. The problem we have is we have, for example, as at now, um, seven selected 
familiar languages. But then we have 72 that are not used as languages of instruction. And the moment you start using these seven at grade one to four, you are depriving the 72 minus seven of the quality education that they, they, they require. So even as late as yesterday, I was reading a new article that was still proposing that we continue using English in the interest of fairness, <laughs> in the interest of equality. If we have to be disadvantaged, let us all be disadvantaged. And so, at the end of the day, you would be talking about continued colonization instead of decolonization. But if the global world wishes to help Africa come out of this quagmire, the idea is to invest resources to empower teachers to teach in the various local languages that exist in those countries. And I believe this is not only a problem of Zambia. There are so many African countries with so many minority or dialects, <coughs> languages. So, colonization may continue. If we take it as colonization, but the issue is we will have to handle development in Africa has to be handled from a, pers from, a, from a perspective of inclusiveness. That whether one is a minority or is in a, from a majority, they have to participate in this same development that we, we actually want. So the idea at the end of the day is we need an inclusive policy, a policy that does not actually exclude some people from the development agenda. And if we are talking about that policy, achieving that policy, we have to speak of issues of equity, equality. They have to be brought to the table, and that should benefit the minority languages as well. So we find ourselves in that particular problem. At the moment, people want that every child must be subjected to a learning channel through English. If you use the local languages, you are disadvantaging the many other languages as well. I'm not really sure whether we are on the right track, but we, are, we find ourselves in that quagmire. It would be better to have policies, as at now, to have policies that would empower the minority languages as well, rather than just selected the local languages. Thank you, Kenneth. Detlef, uh, is there anything you'd like to speak to the, either of these points? Uh, let's just gloss uh, 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 it as development as colonization or uh, also around migration and uh, uh, diaspora return. Yeah, I, uh, my point is um, I think we should get out of the, gla the blame game. Um, this is an argument we've often heard that um, development cooperation is a continuation of dependencies. And there is some truth to that argument, but at the same time, in other places, there is no truth to that. It doesn't explain everything. Uh, we are uh, decades after um, the end of the colonial uh, age, and we have to see that some countries have really changed a lot. Just take the example of Ethiopia again. I don't think that we can explain what's happening at, in Ethiopia at the moment just, just in terms of a continuation of colonization. On the contrary, what we do see is that um, the, the, the very pronounced development optimism that we do see in Ethiopia comes from the country from inside. It is something that comes from the government. So if, if you want to use the term of uh, recolonization, we should rather see that there's new people in power who are no longer um, from the north, but these are people in, in the global south who are themselves controlling and, and colonizing their own uh, country. And that's certainly something that, that has some truth in Ethiopia and in other countries uh, in, in Africa. So please do, let's get beyond um, um, the blame game. The situation is more complicated. Thank you, Detlef. Onikachi. 
Yeah, <clears throat> I'd like to disagree slightly with that. But I mean, I think, the, um, I mean, these issues are structural. Um, and to be honest, um, you know, a long time ago, I stopped blaming the colonists for anything. You know, I, I mean, I tend to think it's a little bit like the rain. And if you want to avoid being soaked, you get an umbrella. So, so the, the question is, what is it? Where is the agency with the Africans? Um, because, you know, as the African Americans used to say, if you're a doormat, you will be stepped on. So, what is interesting in the Ethiopian situation is that they weren't colonized, actually, and they have always preserved their policy space, which is the point that Christopher was making. How do you have the agency to preserve your policy space? Why were the Chinese, the Indians, able to do that? Because, quite frankly, a lot of the advice over the last 40 years on, on development has been terrible. And most of the Africans have been like doormats and got along with it. You were told to uh, shut your <coughs> tertiary educations from the World Bank, and you did that. Why would you do that when that is the source of modernization, if you're serious about the project? So I think there is an element of this, and, and what I'm much more interested in is why have those countries who are not moving forward or protecting their policy space to decide what they want to do and um, assess advice on the basis of their own understanding of reality. Um, why have there been so few? And that, for me, is a much more interesting question. Um, in terms of the diaspora issue, um, I, used, I met somebody who returned back after 40 years in the UK to Jamaica and then said, oh, the Jamaicans don't like me and they don't understand me and they don't... Uh, and I'm like, well, you left 40 years ago. The country hasn't stopped. Yeah? So if you're going to go back, you need to make the politics to go back. Because life moves on. You may have stagnated, but um, Jamaica is a different place. So in the same way that we've made the politics and expanded our rights to be here, you need to do that there. And this is also about how we increase you know, the knowledge production, the institutions that are, enable us to, to make that politics. Um, there is um, an a lack of awareness there as well about what the diaspora brings to the table. And that, those are the things that we have to put on the, you know, that we have to um, um, make people much more aware of. And that's what you then need to negotiate, um, you know, the, your new role. Um, you know, again, I was talking to a, a Nigerian professor, a vice chancellor of one of the leading universities in the country um, about 10, 15 years, sorry, 10 years ago, and said, have you thought about having a, a chair, not a department, just a chair in diaspora studies? Or, or, and, he, and he looked at me like, why would I want that? Uh, and, and then I had to explain that something like, you know, 20% of his foreign exchange was coming from diaspora. And I can't see why the leading university is not interested in where 20% of its foreign exchange is coming from and how it maintains that and grows it and does what it needs to do. So I think, you know, all of us, what I try to do in my presentation is to talk about um, Africans as economic actors, not as victims of all of this. We, we are exporting labor. We're just doing it very badly. Let's actually do it better let's skill that labor get value for it and do what we need to do rather than this perennial thing that things happen to us rather than us having the agency to determine this we are the biggest transnational almost after fdi flow of finance into all our countries what does that mean if you're a british um, business person and you go to ghana the minister will see you if we go nobody but that's also a result of our function. You know, somebody will meet you at the airport, treat you like you're a god, and, but we go along and, you know, who, who are you? And you're treated the way that you are. That's, that's ridiculous. So I think we need to raise our game in the process. 
Just to add as a slight footnote to uh, your question in terms of diaspora return, I'm informed that in Somali there's a neologism which is duyushpura, which means diaspora in a pejorative sense. So who are these guys coming over here with their Western passports, Western education, stealing all the best jobs? So I, it, it is nuanced and it's certainly not clear cut. Marie, were there any points you wanted to ad address out of the two? Uh, I, I'll go with, um, I would say not a continued colonization, but an evolved colonization, actually. And I'm speaking from my experience in Congo, which is perhaps one of the most extreme ex uh, examples you could have of a long-term, um, very entrenched presence of NGOs. And I think one of the biggest successes of NGOs in Sub-Saharan Africa has been the contribution to an African middle class. Um, anyone associated with an NGO is living in a very different socioeconomic status than their rural counterparts that they are working on behalf, uh, in fact. Um, and this is, could not necessarily be a bad thing. Of course, I, I want my African colleagues to enjoy uh, those, those privileges as well, but I, I fear that it's, um, we've always seen that there are intermediaries involved in colonization and also um, now in, in my presence and all of the NGO workers' presence in, in these contexts, um, and what are the consequences of those intermediaries then now living a very different reality than, for example, people in rural areas that the programs are trying to, um, to reach. Um, and we come up with, especially in health and development, certainly in the sexual and reproductive health arena, what happens when our agendas from the global north clash with the agendas of uh, our, our colleagues in Congo or Rwanda or anywhere that we're working? How do we negotiate different ideas of development, different visions of development, um, and when we're, when we're trying to get away from colonization, um, but then I have my uh, Congolese colleagues who tell me, my male Congolese colleagues who tell me that rape does not exist in marriage. How am I supposed to mediate those two very different worldviews coming from a woman uh, and an advocate for reproductive and sexual rights? Um, but that is, that's the cultural context that I'm working in. So these conversations, I think, I would agree that it's a much more complex colonization now um, than we had before, where it was literally black and white. Um, I think there are a lot of gray areas now uh, in these conversations. Thank you. Chris, anything? Um, anything you'd like to add? It is more, it is more complex, and largely because the, the, you have the, the great joy of multiple sources of power globally now as, as well. You can be colonized by lots of people. Um, I, I, I had a friend, no, it's not a good thing, sorry. Um, I, I had a friend who, who um, he wrote about it and used to talk about it, sadly she died, about the first American empire and the second American empire. And in the first American empire, from the end of the Second World War until about 1979, the motto was, you do it your way. So as long as uh, countries and their governments were not raving communists. They would get lots of Western support, and they could kind of largely do what they wanted. They could experiment with economic policies and so on, so South Korea, etc. The second American empire uh, bit hard from 1979 onwards, and is the, the era of the Washington Consensus, and the motto was, you do it our way. And there was very, very restrictive policy space. I think, despite the ongoing, the lasting pressures, the conditionalities, despite the enduring arrogance of Western diplomats and governments and so on and so forth, I think we are beyond the extremes of the Washington Consensus, and there is more scope for, for debate. And within that context, the onus tends to be, I think, it might not be for me to say, on African politics, societies, and leaders to, to grab that opportunity. And I think, to go, bring back briefly to Ethiopia, there are Ethiopian flower growers as well as Dutch. There are Ethiopian vegetable exporters, so on and so forth. But the real issue is about maximizing the, the linkages, the domestic gains. It is it's very, very striking in the vegetable business how absolutely all the inputs are imported. Uh, and in the Chinese built light railway in Addis, you know, the stone tiles on the, 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 the slope down into the only section which is underground. I mean, it's obvious they can be produced in Ethiopia, but they're shipped over from China. These are things that, you know, can do something about. Right? So I, I think that's where the issues really are, and I think the, 
the responsibility largely lies domestically. Salvatore, any final reflections on these two points before we open the floor to more questions? Well, talking about law, the, the situation is, is, very, is very complicated. Uh, first of all, what we mean by decolonization of law. I think um, decolonization of law in Africa means that the African legal culture, the African spirit about law must be into the laws of the African countries. At the very end, the law is not made for me or other colleagues to stay here on this table and dissertate about it. It's made for the people to apply it. And people don't feel confident if they don't recognize in the law. It's, we are talk, the, this panel goes across the general idea of governance. And we, if you go around in Africa, many people say that Africa needs the rule of law. But rule of law is a Western concept. If you think and if you look around in the, in the, in the scholarly work, scholars today admit that there is a rule of law with Chinese characteristics. Why is not possible to have a rule of law with African characteristics? The message I brought in my presentation is that the, uh, the cultures of the African people must be brought into the law. But this is in the hands of the, Africans, the African people themselves at the very end. Because if in Togo or in um, Tanzania, when there is a new law to be made, the government asks a Western consultant to draft the law. What is the, in, the, in, I mean, the, the background of the Western consultant? The Western one. What is the interest of the Western consultant? Invoicing <laughs> the government that gave him the task. At the very end, we have a, a very nice piece of law that is most, mostly not applicable. Just to give you a, a couple of examples. In, in Western Central Africa, there is an harmonized system of business law <coughs> that is the same for 17 countries. It's a huge, I mean, it's a huge achievement ideated by the Africans. But at the, very, at the end, they asked, this covers mostly former French colonies. At the very end, they asked French consultants <laughs> to make the law. What the French consultants did, they, cop they mostly copied paste the French law. And for example, in the, in the, the one about securities, the only, the only security of, of removables is the mortgage. You, you would say normal. But then if you go and look at, the, the, at the, the experience of these 17 countries, less than 3% of the land is registered. How can you give a mortgage if your land is not registered? A colleague from Belgium who was entrusted, and this is the final point, who was entrusted to make the, the draft law about contracts was requested to make a law based on a, an extremely modern uh, pattern that is the UNIDRA principles of international commercial contracts, taking into consideration the African specificities. He was very smart. He traveled. 14 out of these 17 countries to investigate what, which were the African specificities he has to take into account. And speaking with judges, uh, government officials, uh, law professors, no one was able to give him any hint about the African specificities of contracts out of the fact that there is a high level of, of illiteracy. So, from my point of view, this is what, I mean, the African, the African people must 
take conscience that they have the tools to produce their own laws that are based on the legal on their own legal cultures and that are useful for the people thank you um <laughs> Okay. I'm also slightly impressed that we've managed to get to nearly 3 p.m. before China is mentioned. <laughs> okay, okay, can I just add something? Go on, 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 on before that, I answer and, the next, and, before we get the next question. And, and thanks for a really great response on that. I mean, I just wanted to say that, I mean, in the Nigerian context where I'm from, um, you'll find that something like between 60 and 80 percent of legal disputes are settled at customary level in the villages by a chief or... or, or whatever framework that they have. Um, in, in my part of Nigeria, it would be a group of old men who would do that based on, in, in our place, um, a system that literally translates to Menala as conduct and the land. So the principles of how you, you, you do jurisdiction, sorry, how you, your legal pr principles are derived from the relationship <coughs> with the land and the transition we made from uh, hunter gathering to settled farming communities and a series of approaches to uh, customary law um, embodied in that principle. Now, what happens in Nigeria is that most pe the reason most people won't go through the, the British or the Western uh, state system is that one, they're afraid of the cost. Secondly, if you don't speak English, you're in a a context where you won't even understand what's going on in terms of the proceedings. Secondly, um, you can be caught up in that system. Some people have been on parole, sorry, on, on bail um, for, you know, five years, sometimes seeking legal redress. And then there's the issue of fairness because people sometimes don't try and trust the judges and everything else. So the reality is that, you know, the a vast number of legal disputes are settled at this other level, um, which is, again, not recognized because most of the people involved in that system are not paid. You know, what, what would happen is that the, the two disputing parties in my village, you take a, you know, a, a hen or something or, or, or a goat to the person who does uh, the arbitration, and, um, and at the end, everybody accepts the verdict. But they're not part of any kind of legal system within the country. They don't receive resources. Um, there's no conversation about how you transfer some of the best practices in that other system into this system. The two just kind of operate in two parallel worlds. I mean, it's, um, <laughs> and, and so I, I really take on board a lot of the points that, um, that are being made there about the importance of just actually looking at what, what is going on in terms of reality. And this does have very significant um, kind of consequences. I mean, what happens is that the state, when it wants to solve problems, pours a load of money in, pulls a lever, and of course there's nothing at the other end because the other end is completely operating in its own parallel track. Thank you, Onikachi. Right, let's take two or three more questions from the floor, and I'm going to take them from this side of the room because I don't, uh, I'm often accused of being a leftist, so let's look right this time. Uh, I'll take the gentleman in the suit who's uh, sat there. Uh, yes, that gentleman with the, the blue suit. That'll be the first question. I'll take Frederica next. Sorry, yes, the mic's coming to you, sir. Yes, that was you, exactly right, yes. Oh, thank you to the panel. Um, I would like the panel to address uh, the issue of the state in Africa, or in other words, the, the failure of the state in Africa. Uh, coming, you know, I mean, um, you mentioned the cut and paste in terms of law, but actually the idea of state is a cut and paste from Europe, and it's still an alien, uh, you know, concept in Africa. Just to quote um, someone who was talking, a Kenyan politician who was talking about the elections recently, he said there's no such thing as Kenya. There are, Kenya is a geographical phenomenon, it's not a country. So uh, I think this question touches on all the things that we mentioned before, for example, in terms of language. One reason state is failing in Africa because there are different conflicts between different communities, which language goes first. 
question of migration out of Africa. The people are, the reason our people are dying in the oceans is because there's failure of our people, our, our, our leaders to govern um, the states of Africa. The same goes even to the, to the idea of um, the industrialization of uh, freshness. Uh, that, that seemed to be a flimsy concept to me because underneath Ethiopia, for all the good um, news we hear from it, there, is a, there are huge issues going on there in terms of stability and national unity and so on. So please, could the panel touch on the issue of governance and the state in Africa? Thank, Thank you. you. So we've got a question about the state in Africa, and I might even be attempted to uh, parathensicize it in relation to the state in Africa in a world where increasingly states maybe aren't the kind of units in a globalized world. But I want to take two other questions, one from Frederica and then from uh, Professor Sunny here, and then we'll have some more rounds of questions and give the panel a chance to respond. Uh, thank you. Um, I like this opinion emerging from this panel that the futures need to be African and that we need more African solutions for problems that may be colonial or maybe African or maybe global. I also think that Africa has the potential to give some solutions to the rest of the world. Uh, um, and uh, my particular interest is in languages and multilingualism. And so my question is maybe more directed, or my comment, more directed at Kenneth. But I think it's um, also valid for the discussion we had in the morning. So I think it's really striking to see that the, the, the language issue has not really progressed much since independence. And, you know, we still see it as a problem that can only be solved by having all languages instrumentalized in an education system or all of them continuing to be marginalized. And I think this is a European solution to manage something that is, a, is an African reality, multilingualism. The European solution is to have, you know, these <laughs> bounded languages. Each of them needs to be used in all domains. Each of them needs to have a standard. The standard needs to be taught. And hence, you need to have a territory for this language because you cannot teach 72 languages, for instance, in one place, not even three. We know that even the richest countries in the world who have multilingual language policies struggle to even implement three languages. So what I want to uh, emphasize here is that I believe there are already solutions in Africa because Africa has been multilingual for a long time. And if you look at what happened, happens beneath the surface, what happens in oral interaction in classrooms, for instance, what happens in village assemblies, what happens in regional federations is very flexible um, arrangements to deal with linguistic diversity through interpreting, through languaging, etc. Yet the education systems remain wedded to this very European uh, idea of language. So I think the solution is there, it's just not recognized. And, you know, it would involve rethinking what languages are and how they can be used. In, so can um, I gloss your question yes. uh, as uh, how can African solutions to multilingualism be uh, promoted or some yes. such? Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, uh, there was one other question. I think it was from Professor Sunni we were going to take. I could ask to keep your question or intervention brief. No, just brief. Uh, a comment, actually. You see, the issue of uh, justice administration in Africa, um, specifically in Nigeria, remains the old system type. Judges still write their minutes in long hands. So justice is underfunded and uh, undertaken care of, so to say. But I think I want to just draw your attention to something that is happening now. When you talk of uh, about Africa now, what is the most important thing you know about alternative this, uh, this resolution, idiot. They say it's African magic. And I'll give you an example. There was this particular case of land dispute. A young man was denied the property of his father for a long time. And 12 of his siblings actually came over to take the single plot given to him again. And as the thing dragged onto the court, so at every court hearing, each of those siblings will die. So after the first died, second, third, fourth, up to the eighth, so the judge became worried. And the man would, uh, a day to the court sitting, would say, tomorrow, Mr. Lawyer, don't come home. Or something will happen. Another person will die. 
So the judge got tired and said, ah, what is happening? And the man said, it is God that was killing them, not him. And it was true anyway. So eventually, the judge had to dismiss the case because all the witnesses had died. I said, yes, that's African magic. It works faster than the European uh, justice system. And the, uh, the lawyer eventually sought to know the formula from the man. Of course, I won't tell you that one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, fantastic anecdote. And I was going to suggest that the panel start at Salvatore's end. So maybe this is a good point for okay. him to step in. Um, Thank you. I'll try to be very telegraphic on the three points, state, multilingualism, and justice. Uh, state, uh, you are right. The state uh, is not working in, in Africa. It's the Westphalian model that is not working in Africa. Because uh, this, the Western, again, the Western concept of the state uh, is linked to an idea of separation of powers and uh, the idea of a majority that wants to keep a majority place and a minority who wants to become majority. This is not the African culture. You know this better than me. In Africa, the chief must be the chief of the entire community. Otherwise, he's not a chief. But for the way in the Western, uh, in the Western, in the Western uh, pattern, this is dictatorship. But in the African, in the African culture, if the, the chief is not able to run the community properly, there are mechanisms to remove the chief and to appoint a different chief. So why don't we have to study these things and, and see if they can be incorporated? for example, into a constitution. I mean, this links with the, the, what I was telling before about creating a concept of rule of law with African characteristics. Multilingualism, I'm not a linguist, but what I observe in Africa is that in most of the cases, the vehicular language of the law is the Western one because there are too many languages spoken in each of the African countries. I was astonished when I, I learned that in Congo, in DRC, there are more than 500 different languages that are spoken. So the only common one is the, uh, is the, uh, the, the Western one, and the people study in universities where they are taught using a Western language. So we go back to the, to the issue that my Zambian colleague was was addressing. So again, this moves uh, to another issue, I mean, that I put the, oh, just on the table, that in, ma in many African languages, I would say in most of the African languages, there is no legal terminology. And therefore, it's difficult to create, I mean, to have at least concepts or terms that are uh, coincident with the, the Western ones that are used in the law. So this is, is a, an enormous problem in terms of addressing law and, and the relations between law and language. In terms, in terms of justice, uh, I would link what a professor said with uh, what uh, my uh, Nigerian colleague uh, here said. I think that in terms of I mean, I, I, we can make different examples, but in terms of administering the justice in the African way, is not, nece is not necessary that the two things must go parallel. I think that there is a way of cooperating. I give a very quick example from Somaliland, where the elders can go to the judge, take the file of a case, and decide the case under traditional law. And then the judge countersigns the decision of the elders as its own decision. So basically making, bringing the decision of the elders as a decision of the state. And they do this also in criminal law, using the, the Islamic law principles where the, the, the victim can decide if he wants to be judged by the Kadi, and the elders represent the Kadi in Somaliland.
And there, the judge gives only a small punishment that represents the offense against the state. So there are ways of cooperation. The, the thing is that we don't have to go parallel. We, I mean, conflicting, but just cooperating. That's it. Thank you, Salvatore. Chris, do you have any sort of uh, points to make in response to states specifically, or any of the points raised? Um, it's about the most monolinguistic person in the, in, in the room. I'm not going to comment on, on that, I think. I, I don't find it very easy to say anything very kind of neat um, about the states. I mean, I, I, I don't like the suggestion that somehow the European state is a kind of a historical natural thing and it's completely unnatural elsewhere. It's, it's a historical evolving and very, very complex um, set of institutions. And, and I think that we, you know, you can't expect it to look the same in all places at the same time. Um, and, and I think what's, what's going on is experiments in state and, and they shouldn't be expected to, to take some kind of beautiful, perfect shape fast. It's always been a conflictual thing um, everywhere, and I don't know what the future of the state in Africa or in that strong and stable place called the UK is either. I really, 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 really don't. Um, but, but, but I would say one thing, which is that, that it's often seen as though it's... Um, Again, this thing I don't totally like, the failure of the state in some African and other parts of the world that leads to a lack of development. Sometimes it's, it, it's sort of more complicated dynamics. I mean, I, I, it's not me raising Ethiopia, you raised it this time, but, but it's actually part of what's going on there is actually a consequence of what we call, or some people call, development. It's, so those, those tensions within that which are, which are raising new tensions, new strains, and they have links to very, very old ones. This is, by the way, this is a part of Africa that Chris Clapham calls non-colonial Africa, and yet it's a part of Africa that has had something, something like a state for a very, very long time. Um, but I, I think those, those, those links between the sort of development outcomes and processes and statehood are, are much more complex than often seen. But. Thank you. Marie? Any points you'd like to make? Here? Sure, I'll be very brief, but um, I think a comment was made earlier that we don't want to be stuck in the past, uh, which I agree with. However, I just think it's impossible to ignore centuries of deliberate dispossession um, and making sure that certain people, Africans, were not uh, welcome into the very messy process of decolonization. So a particular group of Africans is benefiting from this evolved colonization that I mentioned. Um, and you can look at, again, Congo as my reference point right now. Um, if we say that the solutions are with the Africans and then that is a way of us washing our hands of any involvement in a very messy situation. I mean, Congo has been in a political crisis for two years now. So whose responsibility is it to make sure that Africans do have a chance to be a part of a solution? Um, and how do we take into account this, this process of dispossession that has happened since, since colonization? So. Um, I have more questions than answers, but uh, I don't think, I think it's, it's important to, to not, in, in saying that uh, we need to decolonize, we're not uh, washing our hands of, of, of a process that we, as the West, caused, and the consequences that that brings for people who are not included in the current system as it is. Thank you. I think that's quite a desirable end state to be in. More questions than answers. On your catchy? Um, but one really interesting thing in terms of doing the work with the food is that every time we have um, a grassroots meeting and over the last few years if, um, and people come together, they always want to um, recreate or, um, or create the African Union um, afresh. So there's this huge Pan-African spirit out there. Um, and then you look at some of, of the issues within each, each of the countries and how they're trying to, how we're trying to evolve towards this. Of, of course, the AU is there. We, we're all um, kind of uh, invested in that. We looked at the regional economic communities, whether it's ECOWAS, SEDAC, and others, as a way of evolving towards this pan-Africanism that I think um, most ordinary Africans yearn for. Um, I wanted 
you know, I don't want to make this the kind of the Nigerian discussion, but it's the one that I know, I know best. But I wanted to talk about the Nigerian state, which is, again, going through um, a number of stresses at the moment with people wanting to, to leave again. There's discussions, and we've seen the conflicts in the Northeast with Boko Haram. We, a generation before, we saw the conflicts with in the Niger Delta. So there's, you know, we've got this colonial construction uh, and people inside of it and who have, a lot of people are not feeling very happy. Um, most of us would agree that it's not, you know, it should be perhaps a double trillion dollar economy. And so it's underperforming given its resources, the people, the talent and everything else. So it's really underperforming. So what, what are the issues? What, what are the problems um, within that? And, and is it to do with the colonial, the nature of the colonial state? I think one of the things that I do when I, I look at that is to do a, a, a balance sheet and to look at some of the challenges that that state is facing, which is that, you know, as, uh, as um, Christopher said, you know, we, we are where we are as a result of history. Um, so all these people were put together by, by the British. We, at independence, we chose to stay together. But essentially, it's a very tough call. It's, it's a little like having, if you look at the population size, the way that people do things, the different cultures, the different religion, you know, Europe's got perhaps 5% Muslims, and you can see <laughs> the, the, the issues that uh, Europe's having trying to accommodate that. Nigeria's 50 percent Muslim, 50 percent Christian. It has huge um, population groups. So it's a, a little bit like putting Germany, Spain, um, perhaps not Germany, but Spain, um, uh, the Netherlands, um, Italy in one country um, and with lots of other smaller groups and then expecting coherence at the center. I mean, this is, with, nobody would do that. And, and we can see the tensions in Europe from the British trying to work out how that works, you know? Um, but on, on the plus side, what, what do we have? We have, you know, 180 million Africans, the, the most advanced and biggest Pan-African experiment at the moment. And most Pan-Africanists always dismiss Nigeria, but it's actually the best experiment of 180 million people um, using broadly the same laws, same currency, and has free movement. You know, an, an immense achievement, and has since 1960, aside of the civil war, has been innovating around how we make this union more manageable. So the principles of federal character, the issues of how we share resources, but there are some big issues, and those issues are not unique in terms of the problems that the state is going to the Nigerian state or the African states. There are issues now. Of if you're looking at globalization, how do you handle freedom of movement? How do you handle in these bigger constructions, whether it's the EU, the competence, the balance of competence between the center and the federating units or, and that conversation is going to go on. I don't know whether the Nigerian state itself will survive as a result uh, of that or whether it will break uh, you know, I mean, the, the joke about it breaking up is that nobody's going anywhere. If the Igbo go or the Northeast, they'll still be in the Niger area. So the big issue is how do we organize the neighborhood? And, and what are the values that keep us together as a neighborhood, that we respect each other? Uh, and that, and we're going to have to resolve that. And that also then enables us to do the most, um, um, to be able to develop that neighborhood so that people feel that they're involved and everything else and, and provided with, with justice and access to, to justice and all the other things that people want. And it seems to me that those questions are not African questions. They're being played out everywhere at the moment globally. Um, I hope we find um, African uh, kind of uh, solutions to that that accommodate our cultures and and, and, and where we and the visions that we have for ourselves in uh, in that region, but I, you know, I I think it's a it's a balance sheet, uh, and at the moment it's it's interesting where it is. <laughs>
Thank you, Onyekachi. Detlef, anything you'd like to say about the futures of African states or African multilingualism? Well, let, let me just link up to uh, Onyekachi just said. I, th I think um, we should stop uh, exoticizing um, our understanding of African states. So we probably all agree that um, we have to get beyond stereotypes of weak states in Africa and, and efficient and strong states in the West. I mean, just look look at the newspapers uh, of what's happening in our countries here in Europe at the moment. Here, I, I think we would get much further um, than than understanding states as containers um, in the in the sense of the Westphalian uh, model by. Uh, trying to understand how heterarchy um, evolves. So different systems of, of control uh, and governance um, that overlap. And this happens in Africa as well as in Europe. So um, again, we, we need another theoretical background to understanding these processes, which do not only happen in Africa. And the second point, Friederike, um, I think he had a very strong remark um, when we when we try to understand what's happening in terms of development. Your point was that African solutions do already exist, but the point is we don't listen to them. And um, the first conclusion for me would be that when we do development, uh, and I, I'm not against doing that, uh, we should stop preaching and start listening. Um, and the second thing we need to understand, and that's something for development uh, research, and now I'm coming to Paul's question, um, it's not only detecting solutions, but we should understand the obstacles why these solutions are not implemented. Thank you. Kenneth, anything you'd like to add, either on states or on language, but I suspect language. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it looks like uh, my co colleague has answered uh, what I really wanted to say. Except uh, we have to understand that the background of um, African development has to do very much with colonialism. So the blame game that we are talking about will continue being there. So at the end of the day, all we need is that both of us, the colonizer and the colonized, have to find solutions to the problems that we have created. Okay, so what am I trying to say? Uh, we understand very well that um, uh, language, for example, uh, and that is my comment, uh, that's where my comment really comes. Language, and especially local language, or is it your, your mother tongue, is key in understanding development, whether in education, in economics, any other sector. And most of the uh, European countries, your research, I mean, re my readings show that uh, you have developed because you understood development from your own language perspectives. Okay, which is actually a, a very good idea that we have also understood that we can embrace our own local languages and understand development from those perspectives. However, the problem that was created was that English was planted. Fine, blame game over, we tried to bring in the local language, but then it doesn't still solve the problem because there are so many other local languages. So, uh, research actually shows, there, there are so many researchers that have actually uh, identified in Zambia uh, that have I uh, uh, um, uh, pointed to the fact that <coughs> learning in the seven selected local languages actually doesn't actually uh, advantage the many other 72 minus seven. So what we are saying is the solution is there. We are trying to come up with those, but where are the resources going to come from? Okay, so where are the resources going to come from? Uh, why can't the global world then identify? Because Researchers have written, they have, they, have, they, have, they have done the research, they have written, they have published. And the fear to have these policies implemented positively, we would definitely go for the 77 languages, for example, for the 72 languages. But the thing is, where would they get the resources? So they fear, perhaps, that is one problem. The territorial policy languages that was proposed, um, again, the problem with Africa, I don't want to run out from it traditional, um, uh, is that uh, the fear to lose power. I think that's actually quite a nice point at which to end uh, our little panel discussion around power. I just want to throw in a little anecdotes because we've been talking about language as well. In Amharic, the official language of Ethiopia, the word for a foreigner, a white foreigner, is Tharanj. It's from the Arabic word, Tharanji, means Frankish. But uh, in Addis slang when I was last there a few months ago, the word they use for foreigner now including foreigners who look like me, is China. <laughs>
Um, unfortunately, the time's with at hand is against us, so I'm going to have to cut short this uh, uh, panel discussion and Q&A. It's a shame because it was just getting interesting, but I'm mindful that people need uh, uh, refreshments and f food. So I'd like you to give a big round of applause and thank you to our most excellent panelists. Thank you to you as our audience for, for interacting and engaging with us so well. And let's go and hunt and gather upstairs. Thank you.